right, uh, hey everyone. Okay, so today we are going to look at uh, sort of what I like to think is an extension of what we've seen so far, okay? And there's a lot of uh, infighting in statistics about different statistical ways of doing things. And we're very uh, chill about that in this course. We're mostly uh, open to all uh, methods. Uh, but I think that uh, Bayesian statistics has been dominant in some fields in, in the last couple of decades, actually. Uh, and you'll see that this has a lot to do with the new availability of uh, computing power, but it's also a very flexible way of doing statistics. And I think it's a, a useful thing to learn. Um, this course is a little bit mid-loaded with methods of how to fit models. And next week, we're going to cover more like what we do with the models, right? So this is, again, is going to be a very sort of broad pass on what Bayesian statistics is in comparison to what we've seen so far. And we're going to focus a little bit on the, the fitting methods that we use, that they're a little bit different. And I, I think I want to do this because I think looking at the fitting methods in Bayesian statistics is useful to understanding what we're trying to do, OK? So it's not without purpose that we're going to look into a little bit of a technical side of this. OK. So up until this point, we've been using maximum likelihood, right? And this is a, uh, a tradition that was started by Fisher as much of statistics, right? And Fisher had a lot of conversations with other statisticians over the 21st century and a lot of disputes. He was a difficult guy. If, you ever, if you're a biologist, you've heard of Fisher because of his role in developing genetics. If you're a statistician or a physicist, you've probably heard of him for his role in developing uh, statistics. And he was as bellicose in both fields, right? So he fought with everyone. But the maximum likelihood tradition is a very interesting one, a rich tradition that has many advantages, right? And so you, you saw that if we can light, write down a likelihood, we can use this method to get estimates, right? And it's a fairly automatic thing to do. You can use those generic optimizers that we used in the exercise last class. If you can write a, a, a likelihood function that takes parameters, you can stick it into those, that machinery and you get an estimate. Sometimes it takes a little bit long and you need to use something more complicated. But overall, it's a very powerful method because it's mostly automatic, right? You just have to be able to write a likelihood. Uh, it has very good performance, right? So maximum likelihood estimates are optimal in several ways. They're not optimal in all of the ways, but they're optimal in many ways that people care about. And it, there's this link with, uh, you can use it in sort of a, hypothesis testing sort of way that is useful. So a lot of people find that useful. And so uh, maximum likelihood is indeed a very powerful way to do things, OK? Uh, so this is a, a summary of what we've seen so far. Basically, what you do if you have some data is you write down this function, this function right here, which is the probability of having observed that vector of data given some set of parameters, right? And we think of this as being a function of the parameters now. So this, we write the likelihood like this, right, with a fixed data and a variable that is a parameter, right? And then we maximize this in relation to this parameter, and we get an estimate, right? And this estimate, we can use it to do all sorts of things. Uh, you can do all the further references using this, this estimate of the parameters that you got by maximizing this function, right? Is everything up until now clear for everyone? Any questions on what I just said? OK, good. And so maybe this last line is a little bit confusing, but we can uh, talk about that later. But what I'm saying here is that every other procedure that you're going to do with your data, you're going to use, uh, with your estimate, sorry, you're going to use this maximum likelihood estimator, right? So you can do other things with it. You can calculate significance values. You can uh, calculate variables of interest. You can use, this is sometimes called a plug-in approximation. Oh, sorry. This is sometimes called a plug-in approximation because you take your estimate and you plug it into another function and you get some other estimate using that, right? This 
can become clearer later, maybe not, but all I'm saying here is that once you have this estimate, you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. Uh, visually, what this looks like is that you define this log likelihood surface, right? And you try to find the minimum or the maximum, depending if you put a minus in front of it. Basically, you want extreme points of this surface, right? And these extreme points are going to be the estimates. Okay? And if you, if you have a computer algorithm to, to find this estimate, you're basically going to do like a gradient descent or something to, to go down this surface and find your estimate. Okay? So you're looking for that single point estimate. And you, of course, you can do profiling. If you want to calculate uh, confidence intervals like Paulo showed yesterday, you can fix one of these values and you can take slices of the surface and you get confidence intervals in some way. Okay? Everybody happy with that? Okay. Okay, now on to Bayes, right? So what changes in this situation? First, I need to talk about why we call it Bayesian statistics, right? And we call it Bayesian statistics because of this guy. So this is Reverend Thomas Bayes. He was a British clergyman. And he did some work in probability theory, and he famously derived this result that uh, people that don't like to assign too much weight to Bayes call it the product rule of probability theory. But it, most people call it the Bayes theorem, right? And what is this thing saying? It's saying that if you have two events, right? So let me draw this. I'm going to do a very pedestrian demonstration of the Bayes theorem here for you guys on the board. So if you have two events labeled A and B, OK? Let me switch to the, this the one this way. Yeah. If you want to do, if you have two events labeled A and B, and you want to know the probability of the intersection here. So this is the probability. What is this intersection, right? It's the probability of A and B at the same time. OK? Good. How can we write this out? Well, we can write this out by saying, well, suppose we are in this region. Let me use a different color. Assume we are here. What is the probability of this internal region here? It's going to be the probability of landing in B given that you have already landed in A. OK? So to describe this little intersection, I can say, well, if you are in A, this little region is the region that B also happens. But I have to take into account the probability that I landed in A, right? So I multiply this by A. So what is the chance that I land in A? And given that I landed in A, what is the chance that I land in B? And this gives me the intersection. OK? Everybody happy with that? This is a very simple probability theory uh, theorem. Okay, that allows you to write down uh, joint probabilities as conditional probabilities. Okay? Good. What am I going for here? Yeah. This rather trivial result allows us to do some interesting math when we're talking about data and parameters, right? So in the maximum likelihood way, we describe all our inferences using this maximum argument here, right? While in the st Bayesian statistic way, what we do is instead of thinking about only this probability of having observed the data given the parameters, we use this little guy and the Bayes theorem to get this. So basically, I'm inverting this. If I continue this, I can also write this the other way around, right? So P, A, B, P, B. 
And if I take this guy and divide it over here, I get an expression for this, right? And that's what's going on there. So we multiply by the probability of the parameters without having seen the data by the likelihood, and we get this thing, which we call posterior probability, which is the probability of observing each parameter value given that we have seen this data, okay? This is a little bit wonky because now we're talking about the probability of the parameters. Usually we think of the parameters as being fixed, right? And this is kind of weird. So instead of thinking this of this as the probability of the parameter, I want you to think about it as a description of your knowledge of the parameter. It's not that the parameter doesn't have a value in nature, it's that we don't know of it, right? And we're gonna describe our knowledge about it using probability distributions. Does that bother anybody? This, this bothers a lot of people, so feel free to, to say something and, and, and ask questions now. I will give you 10 seconds to think something, sure. Yeah, if you, you could go over <laughs> the whole this, thing? Yes. Yeah, okay. So let me write it out on the board using the, the, the symbols that I use there. Uh, Okay, so, so let's start with the joint probability of parameters and data. Parameters and data. We can write this as probability of parameters given data times okay I just rewrote the Bayes theorem using y's and thetas okay now I'm gonna isolate this term here Let's go over this again. So now, this is Bayes' theorem with PY in the bottom here, okay? This is the probability of the parameters given the data. This is the posterior distribution. This describes our state of knowledge about the parameters. This is called the prior distribution. This is the probability of observing each parameter value before we have any data. This is the usual likelihood. This is the probability assigned to each data given the parameters. And this is the probability of the data. This is um, unimportant in this case because this is a probability distribution. This thing has to sum to one. So this guy is a constant. Okay? This is just here so that this thing is normalized. So that it sums to one once you integrate over theta or sum over all theta values. Don't think about it too much. We usually write this. It doesn't matter in computations, and we usually write it like this. This is proportional to this, excluding some constants, some multiplicative constant that won't affect our inference. Okay? So you, if you want to think about the Bayes theorem, just think about this part. It's probably easier. Okay. We're going to talk more about this, but this is the usual likelihood. Everybody's happy with this. This is the prior distribution. This is what you think about the parameters before you started your experiment, right? And we're gonna uh, discuss ways of setting this later. We have to define this, right? And this gives us a probability distribution for the parameters. And this is very useful because we can do a lot of inference using this, right? There's a lot of information in this distribution here, as we'll see, okay. Is that clearer for everyone? Any questions? Yeah. Can you repeat 
Go ahead. Can you repeat the middle term of what it is again? This please? guy? Yes. This guy is the prior distribution. This is the distribution that you assign to parameter values before you've seen your data. Okay? Good. Uh, vote up the slides. Okay, I'm gonna give you some references here if you wanna read more about this. There's, uh, Bayesian statistics is actually older than, than frequentist and maximum likelihood statistics. And, and this book is a very influential book. It was uh, published posthumously. Uh, Edwin James died in 98. The book was published in 2003. But it, it circulated as a draft for a long time. So it was a very influential book in, in disseminating a, a certain interpretation of Bayesian probability. And this is, this is such a confusing thing that a lot of the 20th century literature is discussing what this means, right? Is this, is this probability in the true world? Is it, is it describing our, our, our knowledge? What is this thing doing, right? And this generated a lot of discussion. And this book is a great source for this. They, they have, this book has uh, very good historical chapters describing all of the discussion in the literature. Uh, I'm also gonna recommend this book as a first introduction to the topic. This book is written as sort of a, a primer on statistics that really doesn't need any other uh, foundation. But it's very computational. It doesn't have a lot of math. And it's, it's a great read. There's also great lectures from it on YouTube. So you can watch that if you want to, uh, after having this, this class as sort of a, an appetizer, you can have this as a main course. It's a much longer course. It's like lots of lectures. And it's a, a fantastic book to follow uh, closely. A lot of our examples come from this book because it's really great. Okay. So what does this mean in practice, right? So if we define a prior and a likelihood, then we get a posterior. It's just the product of these things. So if we choose a prior distribution, if you choose this guy to be a flat line, like all parameter values are equally likely between zero and one, then we get a, a posterior that's shaped just like the likelihood. So in a way, maximum likelihood is Bayesian inference under this condition. If you choose a flat prior, a prior that assigns equal probability to all parameter values, you get basically maximum likelihood. So in this way, I, you can think of Bayesian statistics as, a, as uh, an extension of maximum likelihood, right? So all of the results from maximum likelihood will hold in this case, right? And you can use the maximum of this distribution to make do inference and things like that. But you can also encode more information if you want to. Assume you, you, you're absolutely sure for some reason that your parameter is between one half and one, and you're absolutely sure that is absolutely not between 0.5, right? So it's zero probability from zero to 0.5, and then equal probability, all parameter values are equivalent from 0.5 to one. What do you get? Well, you multiply this by the likelihood you had before, and you get this weird posterior here with like a truncated non-derivable kind of step here, and it's fine. You can do inference with this thing. And this happens in practice. I'll, I'll give an example. Sometimes you're measuring, for example, uh, the mass of a particle for some reason. And you have a measuring equipment that's very noisy. And sometimes for a very light particle, you might get a negative measurement because of uh, fluctuations, right? And so what would be the usual thing to do? You might look at that observation and say, oh, this is a weird outlier, I'm gonna throw it away. Or you can say, well, I know that the mass of my particle is not below 0.5, but the likelihood of me observing that is clearly not zero. I have a data point. But I'm sure that the parameter that I'm measuring, the mass, is not below zero, right? And so you can use this weird outlier point to inform you about the error structure, but the prior information will inform you that you're sure that your mass is positive because it's a mass, okay? So you can, you can use this in practice if you want to. Or you can have, I don't know, some weird esoterical uh, prior here with a, a sharp spike. And you just do the product and you get a posterior and it's gonna have some weird shape and you can do inference with this. And people do this too. I mean, uh, uh, 
a lot of genetic mapping is done using priors that look like this because you're trying to map the genomic effects along the genome. You're measuring a bunch of confounds, right? So if you want to know what position in the genome affects weight, for example, most of them don't do anything. So you might want to have a prior that's spiked at zero. There's a very strong probability of your particular position in the genome having no effect. But then you have some, some tails that allow you to, to estimate larger effects if the likelihood warrants it. So what am I saying here? All I'm saying is that all we're doing is doing a product of one probability distribution by the other to get this distribution of parameters. Okay? Good. Any questions? Trying to go as slow as possible. Okay. Okay, why use the posterior? Why, why do we want to use this weird prior, this weird distribution over parameters to do our inference, right? Well, for one thing, it allows us to do, use probability in more contexts, right? So one of the first uses of things that looked like Bayesian probability was done by Laplace using uh, in, to an, analyze astronomical measures, right? And he was worried about things like the mass of the planets, right? There's no frequentist interpretation for measuring the mass of a planet. You're not going to measure several copies of Saturn and get a distribution of masses that you can then use to estimate the mass of Saturn, right? You're going to use some measurement and get some data and estimate the parameter, right? And but what is the probability that the mass of Saturn is greater than some number? We would like to, to be able to say that, and it means something useful, right? Is that clear? Another example that people like is like, what is the probability that the decimal point, decimal place 3,402 of pi is a 1, right? So the, the, that decimal place in the sequence of pi is a definite number, right? There's no distribution of values for that number in, a, in, a, in the infinite sequence that describes a number pi, right? But we would like to know, well, if I forced you to guess, what would you guess, right? And what would be your probability associations with each of the 10 possibilities of that position in the, the decimal expansion of pi, right? And we can use this interpretation to do that. We can use probability theory to describe our knowledge about what's going on with the mass of a planet or with some other measurement, right? Is that convincing? Okay. Okay, so we can use this posterior distribution to represent our knowledge. This representation can fully encapsulate our beliefs. We can then ask questions to this for using this distribution, like if you, if you believe this distribution, what are the consequences of this, right? And we can do interesting things with that. Uh, the prior information can encode useful information. So the example of measuring a mass and limiting it to be above zero is a useful one. And we can do more interesting things later on. We'll see that. So um, one thing that, we, that I really like to use is uh, scale of the parameters, right? So you can you can sort of limit the values the parameter can take that are compatible with the scientific question that you're asking. And I'll show you an example later today. Okay, but isn't the maximum likelihood estimator the best one? I mean, why, am I, why am I bothering using these other ones? Well, the maximum likelihood estimator is a very good estimator. It has a bunch of good properties, but it, it has also some other not so good properties. So for example, sometimes when we use the estimator to do other calculations, these other calculations can be horribly biased, okay? And it's hard to tell when this is happening. Uh, one example that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is matrix inversion. Sometimes you estimate a covariance matrix, if, that, if anybody knows what that is. Sometimes you estimate a covariance matrix using maximum likelihood, and it's very ill-behaved in the sense that when you invert it, the inverse is a horrible estimate of the true inverse, and you get all sorts of computational problems. And this, uh, it's a very common problem, right? You get these estimators that are uh, unbiased, but ill-behaved, if that makes sense. Okay, any questions? 
That last part? She asked me to repeat. Yeah, OK. She asked me to repeat this last part. So I'll just say this. Sometimes functions of the plugin uh, parameter, like this plugin approximation, using the maximum likelihood estimate to do other calculations, sometimes this goes horribly wrong. OK? You can have very bad biases when you do this. And there are techniques in Bayesian inference that allow you to protect against this a little bit. There are also methods in maximum likelihood to do this. Uh, but they all have Bayesian interpretations. If you, if you ever heard of regularization, it's basically a way to do this. So for example, you don't want to estimate coefficients that are too big. So you do a penalty for having too big coefficients and you reduce them a little bit. Um, for example, if you have, um, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll give a better example later, so I'll skip this. Oh, and it, it expands the range of models we can fit. This is very, the addition of a prior here allows us to uh, control the inference in a more granular way, and we can fit more models, right? So we, we, ha we expand the, the things that we can model using the posterior distribution. Okay. Uh, one thing that comes automatically from the posterior distribution is confidence intervals. So if, if you have a parameter here, a posterior distribution of the parameter here, you can interpret this as being, oh, well, these are the high, yes. No, it's, I think the example you gave about the um, covariance. Yeah. I think it's out of battery. It's because it kind of confused me a little bit. Sure. I mean, w w what, what I was trying to say there is that sometimes you have parameter estimates for example, covariance matrices. So you might estimate a covariance matrix uh, as being, well, it's going to be uh, the, is this right? Something like this. I don't know. Uh, has to be a J here somewhere. There's a sum over I. There's some sum here that you estimate for the covariance matrix, right? And once you get this estimate, this is the maximum likelihood estimate of this. If you try to estimate the inverse by just inverting this matrix, you're going to get something that is very different from the actual inverse. Okay? So this is the true parameter, inverse parameter, and this is the inverse of the parameter estimate. And these can be very different because of stability, computational weird approximation things that happen in this estimate here. And this happens with a lot of maximum likelihood estimates. You get these things where the estimate itself is unbiased and very good, but once you do calculations with it, you can get propagating errors that are very bad. Okay? Does that clear it up a little bit? Do you know what a covariance matrix is? Okay, good. <laughs> if I have to start before. Okay. Anybody else? I'm going to erase this because if I mess up this equation, people are going to fire me. Anybody else? Okay. Can you return to that? Okay. So I was explaining this, right? So if we have this posterior distribution, we can use these high probability regions to describe confidence intervals that are much more uh, what people think when they think about confidence intervals. So we can think, well, this middle region here is a region of a high probability of having the parameter value. So my estimate is going to be somewhere in here. 
And this is going to be a good confidence interval in the sense that, well, this is the region of the parameter space that is likely to contain the parameter. Okay? There's a high probability that the parameter is in that region. Wildly different from the frequent description of confidence intervals, which are awful, which are like a, a frequentist confidence interval. I'm going to try to say it in once. If I mess it up, Paolo has taught me. Okay? If I repeat the experiment several times, the confidence interval is the interval in which repeated measurements of the parameter fall inside it with some frequency. Okay? Is that it? I think that's it. Okay. This is much more what people think when they think about confidence intervals, right? Regions that have a high probability of containing the parameter value. Uh, I'll just say this quickly um, for the physicists in the room. You can describe your model using uh, what we call nuisance variables. That are variables that are useful in describing the model, but you don't actually, you're not actually interested in them. So you can sum over them or, in, or integrate over them. And you get an estimate that's sort of taking into account all of the uncertainty in this parameter and it gets summed over the integral and disappears in the final estimate. And this is useful for describing complicated models in several ways. There should be a new parameter here too, right? You have to have a prior for the, the nuisance variable too. But, okay. I won't linger on this. How do we use the posterior? Right, well, what we do is, uh, we can use it to make estimators, for example. So one thing we can do is use something analogous to maximum likelihood estimation, which is maximum a posteriori estimation, which would be taking the maximum value of the posterior distribution as an estimator, right? Well, this is basically the same thing as maximum likelihood estimation, but we get to use priors with it, right? So if we have information about the parameters that we want to include in the model, we can include it, and it naturally gets included into this estimate. Uh, the posterior mean is a much more common estimator. So this thing has much better statistical properties than this one. And so this is usually the parameter estimate that you're going to be using in uh, Bayesian inference, right? So this, what is happening here? We're just taking uh, the, the mean value of the parameter given the posterior distribution, right? So this gives us the, the mean posterior estimator, which is basically taking the mean of this guy here. Okay? And this is, so this is one thing we can do. We can use the posterior to create estimators. Okay. Uh, how do we do this? Well, usually these posterior distributions are rather complicated because they have many parameter values. We don't have any general way of writing down a statistical model and getting the posterior distribution of the parameters from just analytically. So we usually use approximations. So what we do is we take samples, numerical samples from this posterior distribution, and we, and we end up with this list of numbers that describes the posterior distribution. So for example, uh, if the posterior distribution, the, an analytical solution is drawn here in red, and the histogram is a histogram of these values here. So we are using samples to approximate the posterior distribution. And then you can use these samples to do integrals if you want to. So for example, you can calculate the probability that the, the parameter is above some value by just counting the number of samples that are above that value. Or, and things like that. So it's very, it's, it's like a very uh, easy way to do integrals. It's having a bunch of samples from the posterior distribution and doing calculations with this sample. And we'll have a bunch of examples tomorrow and in the practice section. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the previous classes, mm -hmm. we were seeing that the distribution of the parameters will uh, convert to a normal distribution. Distribution of the estimates yeah. of the parameters. The estimates. So we're talking about this. Okay. 
In this, this distribution case, distribution of the estimator. This is the distribution of the parameter. Okay. Okay. Good. The estimator is something else. If I take the average, if I take the the top value here, that's an estimator. If I take the average of all of these samples, that's an estimator. And those will probably have normal distributions. The distribution of the parameter is something else. Okay. These are values that the parameter could plausibly take given the data that I observed. Yes? <laughs> um, what samples are these exactly? Okay, so these are samples from the posterior. So this is, this is a probability distribution, right? If we have a probability distribution, we can sample from it. Think about the R norm function in R, right? You're giving it a mean and a, and a uh, standard deviation value, and you, you're taking values that are distributed according to that distribution. Okay? Does that make sense? So what does that mean? It means if we take a histogram of those, sample, of those values, we get something that looks like the distribution that we're sampling from. Right? So this is the probability density function. And the histogram of, the, of uh, the random variable sampled from it follows this distribution. But these would not be samples from my data. No, these are samples. The data is fixed here. These are samples from this distribution here. This distribution can have any shape, right? It can, it's a product uh, of anything, right? So we're sampling from this distribution. It can have weird values. So this is the likelihood, the distribution that assigns probabilities to the data you observe. This is the prior, the distribution that assigns your knowledge before seeing the data. And this is the resulting distribution. Now we want to sample for that. We want to approximate this one. How do we do that? Well, we take samples from it, and we use these samples to figure out the shape of it. We'll have more examples tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe this will be more clear tomorrow too. So if that's yeah, yeah. the point, you can just point it out. Sure. But w um, when do we use any of these estimators, the expected value or the median or the maximum argument? Because I see that as you're talking about distributions that are usually not normal, it makes sense to not use the maximum. Yeah. That's why the mean, but sure. it depends on the context or... Well, uh, we can fit complicated models using this, right? So we, we get estimates for a bunch of different things. And depending on what you're interested in, it can be a simple linear regression. You can fit a linear regression using this. And you get an estimate of the error of the intercept and the slope and things like that using this sort of thing, right? Uh, but it can be much more complicated. And you can have posterior distributions with very weird shapes that you cannot write analytically, but, well, you can. It's just the product of those two. But you cannot, uh, using the equations, find out where the maximum value is, for example. That might be very difficult. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Sure. This scales very well. So this scales well to a, a very large number of dimensions. This is one advantage. You can use this. You can have Bayesian models with thousands of parameters. And it works fine, depending on the structure, of course. OK, is this clear, this idea of taking samples to approximate the distribution? Imagine we didn't have access to the red line here. Right? If all we had was the histogram, we would have a very good idea of the shape of this distribution. And we would be able to tell, well, where, where are the regions of high and low probability for this parameter that we're estimating, okay, just using the samples? No? Imagine we didn't have the red line here, okay? All we had was the histogram. Do you agree that the histogram is a good approximation for the red line? Yeah. Where does that histogram come from? Numerical methods. So using this equation, right? Using the product of two, you can do you can do a, a posterior that looks like this. For example, a normal distribution with a mean of let's 
Let's write out a full model here. So if I have a normal distribution of my data, right, and it has two parameters, OK? This is a likelihood. How do I transform this into a posterior, right? Well, we know, you know what the expression is for this, right? It's that exponential of uh, each y minus mu over sigma, right? And this results in a number for everyone, right? And then we multiply it by some prior on mu and some prior on sigma. And this is now a posterior. Can I write out a, let's use an example here. I'm going to write out something out here. So assume the prior on mu is just, uh, so it's a prior on mu, so it's going to look like this. Let's say 1 and 0, actual numbers now, times the prior on sigma, 1, oh, sorry. Mean 0, variance 1, not the other way around, right? Mean 0, variance 1. So hopefully, you can tell that all of these are uh, actual numbers, right? So you can calculate for the values of the parameters. If I set two parameter values here, you can calculate this, and you get a number, right? And it's the probability of having observed those two parameter values given this data. Okay? So this is a numerical problem now. How do I find the regions of high probability for parameter values now? So you set a parameter value, you plug it into this equation, you get a number, and you can optimize that, or you can sample from it. Mostly clear? Yeah. Just a quick question. That graph is just for a single parameter. That's for a single parameter, okay. yes. You can get more complicated ones. I think, not today, but we'll have some. OK, uh, so we can use these samples to do any kind of calculation that we want. So for example, that complicated mean estimate that involved a sum or an integral here, we can just take the average of our samples, and that will give you an estimate of the posterior mean. right? And you can use these samples to do whatever other calculation you want to. OK. What is different here? from maximum likelihood. We are not looking for the tip of the distribution, the most l probable parameter when you do this. We want to sample the whole distribution, right? We want to have an idea of what values are more or less likely. Yes, probable. Okay. Uh, I, I still have some trouble accepting that the mean of the posterior is a better estimator than the maximum a posteriori. OK. That's and fair. I would like to know why would you use the mean and not the most probable point for the parameter? Uh, it depends on what you're optimizing for. So for uh, the, the usual justification for the using the mean is that it minimizes mean squared error. So it, it leads to uh, predictions with less error, basically. Uh, and we can open up the Jane's book later, and I can show you how. Usually, you have to define a loss function. Like, how, how do you care about the difference between the true value and the parameter value? If you care quadratically, if, you, if you're caring about mean squared error, right, you penalize larger errors more than you penalize uh, close by ones quadratically, you get this, this as the best estimator. If you care about average error, sorry, absolute error, and not quadratic, but absolute difference between the estimator and the true value, you get the median of the posterior. If you don't care at all about the value of the error, if you think that all errors are equally awful, and you only care about hitting the bullseye of the estimate, you get maximum likelihood. Okay. So usually, the, the, these choices of, it, of loss functions, like how much do you care about missing the target, uh, leads to different estimators. Okay? 
And you can have something more complicated. For one example that people like is assume you are uh, laying a cable across the Atlantic, right? And you're trying to estimate the length of cable that you're going to need. If you miss up, you cut the tip of the cable, and you're fine. If you miss down, the whole thing falls into the ocean and it's lost forever, and you lost kilometers and kilometers of cable, right? So you must care more about missing low than missing high, right? And so you can define a loss function that describes this. Like, it's absolutely unacceptable that I miss low, and it's probably okay if I miss high. But I don't want to miss by too much, because I don't have all that, cap that much cable, right? And that will give you an estimator. You can calculate that. You write a loss function, and you calculate the average error, and you get an estimator. That's going to be a weird, wonky, asymmetrical estimator that tends to miss large instead of, and never misses low. Okay? Okay, okay. Good. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, so posterior derived quantities, usually uh, you can calculate them using the, the, the samples directly. There is uh, no difficulty in this. After you get the samples, you can do whatever you want. Uh, OK, you, this is repeating the same thing. Any other quantity, you can use the samples to calculate. So I'm going to give you an example here using a categorical predictor. So this is our usual description of a model, right? Up until here, right? This is up until this point is the usual likelihood way of describing a model. And in the bottom here, we got these weird parameter distributions that are the prior. So this is a full definition of a model, uh, a Bayesian model, because you have a likelihood over here, which is in this case, K is the caloric content of milk in several monkey groups. And we have a predictor that is the clade, like which large group of mammals this uh, particular monkey comes from. And we want to estimate basically the mean caloric content for all of these clades using this data. And we have some priors here that I'll discuss later. Okay? And what you get from this is this estimate here. And these are confidence intervals. These are standardized so that the mean overall value is zero. So this, these are differences from the overall mean. And you can see the parameter estimates here as little intervals. What I'm drawing is this posterior uh, confidence interval here for some value, like let's say 90% confidence interval. So there's 90% of the probability mass is between these points here, okay? Can ev anybody, everybody read this? So what, what I'm showing are these values here, the, the alpha i's. It's the per group mean, okay? Good. So assume I want to, one thing people do all the time is look at two parameter estimates and say, well, this one is non-significant because it's touching zero here. So I can't tell it apart from zero at some significance level. And this one is away from zero. So it's significant. It's away from zero, okay? And people say, well, since this one is significant and this one is non-significant, they must be different. Okay? This appears all the time in the literature. Be careful. This is completely wrong, right? If you want to know if these two values are different, you've got to calculate the difference between them. And you can do this using the samples. So if I take the posterior samples from these guys, I'll calculate the posterior difference between these two, I get this. So this is the difference between new and old monkeys, and it straddles zeros confidently. This is uh, there's basically non-discernible difference between these two estimates, even though one is significant and the other one isn't. Why am I saying this? This is an example of a contrast. We do this all the time when we do experiments and we want to know if the treatment was different in two categories or something like that. Okay? And you can calculate contrast very easily using posterior samples because it's just the difference between the two guys. If you want to do contrasts in uh, LM, there are full packages just for doing contrasts because it's kind of, you have to sometimes restate the model and use the dummy variables in weird ways. And it's a pain. It's very easy to do here, okay? Just use the, the posterior. Okay, building a model. My first Bayesian regression model. What do we need to define 
a linear regression model using a Bayesian paradigm. So again, up until this point, it's exactly the same since we've seen so far, right? It's a normal distribution on the observations. There is a parameter for the standard deviation, a parameter for the mean that varies with each observation, and each of these uh, parameters for the mean is dependent on a linear function of two coefficients here, an intercept and a slope, and there's a predictor variable here. Hopefully this is very clear for you guys at this point, right? And we can use this to ask, for example, if X affects Y in some way, right? What else do we need to make this a Bayesian model? We need priors. How much time do I have? A lot of time. Okay, so this, these are the priors for these parameters, okay? And how do we choose them, right? What did I tell you? This is the distribution of your belief in the values that these parameters can take before you see the data, right? Where are you supposed to get this from, right? Is a common question uh, in the Bayesian literature of the 20th century, actually, okay? So there are a few choices, right? There are what is called agnostic choices or uninformative choices, right? So this is sort of the, the flat prior school. This is, I have no idea. I'm going to assign equal probability to every parameter value. Laplace even proposed a version of this that he called principle of indifference, right? If before starting the experiment, I don't have any way of discerning the possible outcomes I must assign equal probability to all of them. This is sort of the coin toss example. If I give you an, a coin and you don't know anything about that coin, the best you can do is assign equal probability to the both sides, right? So it's 50-50 would be your belief in the output of that experiment, sorry, the probability of observing each side before you flip the coin any time, right? Does that make sense? Okay, that made sense for a lot of people. So these are very popular choices. They're a bit bad. They don't work that well. They lead to computational problems, and honestly, we can do much better. So we're gonna try to not do this, okay? Maximum entropy priors. Uh, these are also popular in the sense that uh, maximum entropy is a method of sort of getting probability distributions that are as uninformative as possible given some constraint. So you might know something about the, the, the structure of the thing you're looking at, and the maximum entropy is a way to do this in a sort of very principled, non-informative way that is not just flat, okay? And you can use other types of constraints here that are not just your ignorance. You can choose, use things that are more uh, structural, for example, finite variance or something that might be useful. We're also not gonna dwell too long on this, but I wanted to mention that this is a method that exists. Uh, a lot of the priors we use, they are not invariant to variable transformations. So if you change the scale of your measurements, so if you're measuring something in feet and you change it to kilometers or something, uh, the, the value, the models that your prior is describing will change with this, right? If you keep the numerical values the same. So these Jeffrey, Jeffreys was an important uh, statistician of the 20th century. And he devised this method of choosing uh, prior distributions that are invariant to scale transformations. And these are uh, important, but also I think we should use the scale information. So I don't, I don't see much point of using this right now. There's also hard constraints, which I described earlier, which are uh, limit physical limitations on the structure of your parameters. So for example, Variances must be positive, mass must be positive, and things like that. And you can encode that in the priors. Okay, this is more useful than it seems. Because models, they're dumb, right? And sometimes they will get estimates that are absurd scientifically, but uh, given the data that you put in, it's, it's what it spits out, right? And you can, you can use these constraints to limit uh, these calculating machines. Okay. Good choice of priors. Now, the, the things that I recommend you do carefully when choosing a prior is to use domain expertise. Look at the problem that you're studying and think about if 
your knowledge of the system that you're studying gives you information enough to define these probability distributions. And I'll have an example. So for example, knowledge of scale. We're gonna have a height versus weight example that hopefully will, will bring this to Rome. Uh, experimental design is also useful because a lot of the hierarchical priors that we're gonna see next week depend on the structure of your experiment, right? So spatial distribution, similarity between observations, repeated observations, all of these can be used to define priors that are very good. Uh, and one thing we should always do is use simulations to understand what our priors are implying, right? So when we define this distribution, we're saying something. We're saying, well, all of these parameter values are plausible. We can use this to simulate data. So, okay, given that this is the, the distribution of parameters, what kind of data should I observe? Is the data I observe absurd? Or is it plausible, right? Is it, and we can use simulations to look at these implications and decide if our, the priors we're using are sensible or not. Again, examples coming. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, take your time. Would you say that some part of the power of Bayesian things is because you can implement this kind of things when choosing a prior. Like you can, uh, I couldn't formulate it well enough in my head, but you can use knowledge of scale, knowledge of scale. <laughs> You can use knowledge of scale, experimental design, and other prior um, knowledge you have about what you're analyzing and give it as an input when trying to estimate. I'd say that's things. a big part of it. Yes. That's a big, we, okay. it's, this also allows you to, to have model structures that are richer, right? So it's not just that you can encode information, but you can have models that are more complicated and have hierarchical structures or things like that that uh, really do well with this sort of formulation, okay? okay yeah. But yeah, scale information is a big part of this. It really, one thing, for example, that's very useful is to reduce overfitting. So what's overfitting? Overfitting is your model getting too excited with the data, right? It's looking at the data, it's like, oh, I can fit everything here, right? <laughs> and if you have a prior information that is like, well, you know, coefficients, they don't tend to be that big, or that limits the range of values that coefficients can take, it's sort of pulling the coefficients back to Earth, right? It's not getting too excited with the data. So this is one thing that sort of happens automatically with Bayesian models. Mo they're much less likely to overfit, okay? Okay, priors can be used to encode scale information. So what I'm ha showing here is a data set from the rethinking book. We're gonna use it in some of the examples. And this is the weight of a bunch of individuals in a population and the height of the bunch of individuals in the population in kilograms and in centimeters here. And this is the distribution. And assume we want to fit a linear model that goes through this data here. Okay, so how do we choose the priors? One thing we can do, I'm gonna focus on the slow parameter, which is the important one here, right? It's the rate of increase of height given weight. So this is a very wide prior. This would be called uh, a non-informative prior because it's a very wide normal, right? So it looks, it assigns high probability values to a very wide range of coefficient values, right? And what you get when you simulate slopes from this prior distribution is something like this, okay? Now look at this range of possible relations between weight and height and think to yourselves, which ones of these are plausible? Helpfully, I have marked here the zero line for zero height, which is presumably the shortest that an individual can be, and I've marked here the tallest human ever, okay? at 272 centimeters or something. So this prior distribution of the parameters is telling us that it is plausible that an individual with a weight of 20 has minus 100 centimeters of height, and then he grows very fast as he gains weight, presumably, I don't know. 
And when he is 50 kilometers, he's about three meters and a half tall. Right? Okay? Are these plausible regression values? They're not. Right? So why would we use such a wide prior in this case? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just having a really hard time following today. Yeah. Like I don't actually understand what this graph is saying and it, it just looks weird. <laughs> it does, yeah, it does. And let me, I let just... me go back a little bit. So I'm describing this model, right? So it's a model for the linear relation between y and x, and that in our case weights and heights, right? There are two parameters, an alpha parameter that's related to the intercept and a beta parameter that's related to the slope. And I'm trying to decide which distribution to put here as the prior distribution of the slope parameter. So what is the prior distribution of the slope parameter? It's my belief of plausible values for the slope before observing the data. Now, I know the data is weight and height regression of height on weight, okay? And I'm trying to decide which values of this parameter are plausible in this particular case. I'm trying to do this by taking, uh, a putative prior distribution here. So this is a normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 10, okay? A very wide, distribution of parameter values. I'm sampling beta values from this distribution and I'm plotting the corresponding regression line for the simulated betas here. Okay? Why am I doing this? I'm trying to understand the consequences of setting this prior. What am I saying when I say that the prior distribution for beta has this shape? I'm saying that all of these regression lines are possible. Okay? And I'm asking you guys, are these regression lines possible, given that I'm doing a regression? Hopefully you can see that these lines are very improbable, right? Given what I know about human weight and human height, which tends to vary in this range, having regression lines that predict more extreme changes in height and weight than this, is not a plausible or a useful description of the possible values of this parameter, right? So this is a bad prior distribution. And this is what we sometimes call a non-informative prior. This is something that carries very little information in terms of determining the possible range of values of this parameter, okay? What would a more sensible prior distribution look like? This is a nicer prior distribution. Why is it nice? Well, because it still has some absurd values in it, but most of them are in this sort of reasonable range here. This encodes from very weak associations between weight and height and very extreme ones, and this is okay. What am I saying here? I'm saying, well, I'm not sure what the association between weight and height is, but I'm pretty sure that it's something between these values here, okay? I'm not being too strict. I'm not saying I'm absolutely sure that the correct line is one of these, right? Oh, sorry. But I'm also not having those weird two extreme lines all the time, okay? Yeah, go ahead. But why are there negative values in there? Why are there negative values in there? Well, there's not that many, right? There's like one. That's fine. It's not too bad. Maybe the, maybe the slope is really, I don't, I don't wanna impose more information than I need to, right? I don't wanna constrain my model too much. I want to have some room for getting values of the parameters that I didn't know were possible because I haven't observed the data yet, right? I just know that it's weight and height data. I don't know anything else, okay? So you were saying that you, you, you don't like that there's one regression line that is negative here? 
Is that what you're saying? I mean, I kept the scale in both of them, I guess, just so you can see that it's the same thing. Like in this graph, there were a lot of regression lines going down here. In this one, there's not that many. No, but it's like the first thing I know about weight and height, yeah. it can't be negative. Sure, but the, now this model doesn't predict almost any line that goes below here. But Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is a question about the plot. Yeah. The previous one I think is easier to explain my point. So, I understand that you're sampling the slope and yeah. plotting, but Shouldn't you have fixed or e explicitly said what intercept you're using for this plot? Because yeah, I don't understand why sure. they're crossing in kind of the middle. Yeah, there's also a prior for the, the intercept here, but yeah, it's not right. important. So okay, I, it's I understand it's just for yeah, visualization.